Hey, good morning, options traders. Well, you hear me talk a lot about put call parity, and unfortunately, a lot of times traders say, ah, it's just a mindless mathematical formula. Who needs it? Well, it certainly might look that way, but put call parity is one of the most important formulas that you can learn as an options trader. It can show you if you have an edge in the trade. We can also use this to see if you are better off perhaps buying the call or doing it synthetically through the put. We can also use it to figure out if it's worth exercising a call option early for a dividend. And for that matter, if you're short the call, we can use this same formula to figure out if you might be getting assigned. So these questions and many more can all be answered from a very simple formula, and that's why it's so important to understand. Unfortunately, it is just that. It is a mathematical formula, a little mathematical relationship between stock, puts, and calls, and people, again, just get so confused. So for this video, let's put put call parity into focus. As always, please remember to click like. It would go a long way in promoting the channel and would be greatly appreciated. So as I mentioned, put call parity is a formula. This is one version of it. And with a little bit of algebra, we could certainly rearrange this in any number of ways to solve for different relationships. There's a lot of really interesting stories that can be told from this relationship. For this video, I'm just going to put it in terms of a call. And what this is telling us is that the call's value equals the current value of the stock minus the strike price, whatever the strike of that call happens to be, plus the put, now the put would also have the same strike, whatever that put's value is, plus the interest. There's a cost of carry on a call option, not for puts, but it is there for calls. And the reason is that if you buy a call, you are mathematically borrowing the strike price. See, if you have the $100 call, let's say one year out, you don't have to exercise that today and pay for the stock. Instead, you could wait for a year and exercise it then. And that means your money gets to sit and collect interest. So that's a benefit for a call buyer. And we always have to pay for all benefits. So that's going to get tacked into the value of the call. So to understand this formula a little better, let's start with the interest component over here on the right. And to do that, we have to understand what's called the cost of carry. So let's assume that you deposit 100 bucks into a bank that pays 5%. And that means at the end of the year, you will earn $5. But does that mean that that's what it's worth today? No, this value right here, this five bucks, isn't going to get paid to you for a full year. In finance, this is what we call the future value. Well, having money coming to you in a year is certainly not the same as having it land in your hands today. It's worth a lot more today because you could do something with it and at a minimum, you could stick it back into the same bank and earn interest. So it's worth much more to get into your hands today. So we could say what's today's value or in finance, what we call the present value. So to do that, we would say today's value equals the value of this interest divided by one plus the interest rate. So the interest rate expressed as a percentage, 5% is 0.05, so one plus 0.05, we take five divided by 1.05 equals $4.76. What that tells you is that, yes, you're getting five bucks in a year, but you should value that as $4.76 today. Why? Well, another way of looking at this is that if you took 476 today and deposit it into the same bank at 5%, it would grow to five bucks. So should you get five bucks in a year? or 476 today. It's really the same thing. They're equal. One is the future value, one is the present value. So how does this play into the value of a call? Well, let's go over to a pricing model and I'm going to put the stock at 100, strike at 100, 360 days or a year, and I'm going to use a 5% interest rate, which is what we just used. And I'm also going to use this ridiculously low volatility of 1% which you're never going to see in the markets. But the reason I chose this is that it's a way of saying that the stock can't move. It's kind of stuck in the cement here. And we can still see that a call would still have some value to it. What is that? Well, take a look at what the model's telling us. It's saying it would have to be worth 
476. So this tells us that a call's minimum value, the very least it can trade for, is the cost of carry on the strike price. Because again, mathematically, this is what you are floating or borrowing. Now it turns out if the call was trading for something less than this, let's say for $4 or $3, anything less than 476, it sets up what's called an arbitrage, which would be free money for traders by today's standards, the algorithms out there, the computerized trading, and they would certainly bring this back to 476. That's what the arbitrage would do. So we know that it's got to trade for at least $4.76. All right, so hold that thought and let's move on to the second part of the puzzle. I'm going to keep all of these factors the same, but I'm going to increase the stock price from 100 to 110. If we have the 100 strike, there's now $10 of intrinsic value in this call. And that's because you have the right to pay 100 and it's currently trading for 110. You could exercise that call, sell the stock, and pocket the 10 bucks. So we know that the call has to trade for at least $10. But we also said it's got to trade for at least 476. So that means our call has to trade for at least $10 of intrinsic value plus $4.76 of interest. And there it is, $14.76. That's where that value is coming from. But also notice, under these conditions, because I set volatility at 1%, the put has no value. Because we're saying the stock price can't even fall below 100. Just because, again, this volatility is so low. And therefore, the put would have no value. Now, of course, in the real markets, you're not going to see a put trading for zero. This is saying, according to a pricing model, it's completely worthless. And again, that's because we have no volatility in the equation. Well, let's go change that. Let's keep everything the same, but now let's pump up volatility from 1% to 20%. And take a look what happens now. Now it's telling us that the puts got some value. It went from zero to $2.77. And that value has to also get added into the call. So if we take the intrinsic value plus the cost of carry plus the value of volatility, which can be seen in the put, we get the total value of the call. So as a recap, if the stock is 110 and the $100 call is trading for 1753, where is this 1753 price coming from? Well, we know that $10 is coming from the intrinsic value. We know $2.77 is coming from the volatility value, which could be seen in the put. And we also know that $4.76 is coming from the interest. So it's those three components. Now also keep in mind that the intrinsic value could be zero. That doesn't change the math. It's just saying whatever the intrinsic value is, it's either zero or some positive number, that's what goes into this field. So the call options value is always the sum of these three current parts. Now let's go back to our put call parity formula and see if we can make sense of it. What's it telling you right here? Let's look at these first two terms, the stock minus the strike. What is that? Well, in our example, we had a stock of 110 and a strike of 100. That was the intrinsic value or the $10. And that's what the formula is telling you, stock minus the strike. It's saying that the call has to be made up of intrinsic value Let's move to the next term, the put, plus the volatility value, which was 277, and then plus the interest, which was 476. So if you always remember those three pieces, you should be able to think of this formula in your head. It is the intrinsic value. What is that? Stock minus strike. There's a volatility value. Well, if we're trying to solve for the call, that volatility value would be the put. And then there's also an interest value. Of course, once you have this form, you can rearrange it in any number of ways to solve for different problems. What's the value of the put? What's the value of the difference between the call and the put? What's the value of the stock minus the call, a covered call? We can figure out all of these from this formula. But hopefully this gives you a different way to keep it in perspective 
and give you a new focus on put call parity. And for anyone who'd like to learn more about the art and science of options trading, please check out the Alpha Trader course, Strategy Lab, and a technical analysis course. It's all at optionsa to z.com. Also, please join us on the Facebook trading group, Options A to Z, and you can find the link in the description below.